Um, thanks for coming to the Teaching Montana History Online PLC. And this month, the focus is on the skills. The first one, um, we talked a lot about the big picture ideas. And so this time, I thought we could look a little bit about skills. Before we start, um, I'll have Cole tell you a little bit about how these things work. That sounds great. Thanks, Martha. I'm Cole, and if you are on a PC, your controls will look exactly like this. If you're on a Mac, which I know Christy is, they will look slightly different, but um, please make sure that your audio settings, uh, make sure that you can um, hear through your speakers and select the correct ones. You can do a quick sound check if you like, um, or you're more than welcome to join us via a phone call, and it's just a click on the um, button next to phone call to then dial in on your telephone for audio. Um, also, I want to make sure that you um, are aware of the chat box so you can introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, ask questions, comment along the way, and we encourage you to do that. We um, take the chat log and include that as part of the information that goes into the Teacher Learning Hub course that corresponds with this online PLC. Back to you, Martha. All right, so please do go ahead and type in the chat box who you are and where you teach and what grade, and uh, we'll keep, you know, as you have questions to that too. Um, as I said, I'm Martha Cole. I work at the Montana Historical Society, and I'm joined by Christy Moxditz and Cole Barto from Office of Public Instruction. And um, it's a wonderful thing to have this kind of partnership. I wanted to start just last time we spent a lot of time writing our way in. I think most of the session was right your way in. We're not going to do that this time, um, but I do want to, and I'm, I'm going to put a timer on it, spend five minutes uh, on this write your way in document, which you can get to through the link in the chat box, or um, and I'm going to pull it up on the screen. Um, and. Uh, uh, I'm going to put a timer on. If you're watching this as part of a recording later at home, I hope you'll go to this document, please, and go ahead and spend some time reading, writing, and commenting. We're going to keep this document live and going, um, and I think it's really helpful to sort of clarify thoughts. So I'm going to set my um, stopwatch to five minutes, and uh, if people want to join me here, to think a little bit about skills and maybe how they relate to and are different than content, what kind of skills we want to teach, uh, what kind of other skills, you know, well, you can see what other people say they want to teach, and we'll just write for five minutes, and like I said, if you're joining us later as a recording thing, please come here and, and write and comment away. And if you already um, wrote in advance, if you would go to the document and comment on what other people have written or ask some questions, that would be wonderful. I was really impressed last time with the interactions that we saw on the Google Doc. And even afterward, when other people were commenting and you know, reflecting on each other's words. So that, that's really awesome. It's hard to be quiet during these five minutes, but that's what this time is for. All right. Whoop. We are at five minutes. That was a fast five minutes, Martha. That was the fastest five minutes ever. Um, I really appreciated everyone who came here before the meeting started and wrote your comments because it allowed me to um, kind of come and come early and do a little prep um, to see what some of the skills were that people wanted to teach their kids, and then I allowed me then to look at some of the tools that I knew about that might help with that, and I'm. I'm going to go through uh, some of that and um, hopefully other people will chime in if they know a good tool. And so one of the people who responded early uh, in that, who wrote their way in uh, last week, said that they were interested in their students learning um, how to do close reading, which is Tammy really interestingly said in this chat just now that, you know, so many of the skills that we want to learn in history are the same ones that we want to learn in English. Um, one of 
uh, my favorite close reading tools is visual thinking strategies. And I'm wondering, and you can either speak up or type in your message, uh, has anyone ever used VTS in their class? Um, you can go ahead and type in the chat or, um, or just talk out. Uh, but I'm curious if you've ever used this. It is, uh, I think, a tremendously useful tool to um, teach uh, thinking skills, communication skills, visual li literacy, but also really close reading. And it uses mostly images. And the thing I like about that is there's real scaffolding. You can learn to do close reading on images, even if uh, text is challenging for you. And then you can transfer that close reading school to check skill to text. And it's really deceptively simple. Um, uh, the presenter starts by saying, um, uh, what is going on here? And then the students answer. And then this, if a student answers, the teacher then paraphrases their answer uh, to make sure that they got it right, to make sure that they know um, that they're being listened to, to make connection with other people's answers. And then the other question that you can ask is, what do you see that makes you say that, which is asking for an evidence to back up your claim. Uh, so if I'm looking at a picture and I say, she's happy, well, what do you see to make you say that? Well, she's smiling. Okay, I'm looking at her smile. Um, and then what more can you find? So those are the only three things besides paraphrasing that the instructor gets to do with this. Paraphrasing is really, really hard. Uh, the other trick to VTS is not saying, oh, good answer, well, you know, not giving, you know, not expressing your own opinion, not giving praise so that every answer is valuable um, and valid. And it's a tremendous, like I've watched it being done and it's, it's hard to learn how to do well. It takes a lot of practice, I think, especially for teachers who are um, used to telling people about things as opposed to letting them, uh, or maybe, maybe I shouldn't put this on you guys, it's hard for me to, if I have a picture of a homesteading poster, I want to tell you what I know about it as opposed to let you read it closely and figure it out. And then I want to tell you what you got right and what you got wrong. And that's not this particular technique. But I think it's the kind of thing that practicing looking closely at an image and deriving meaning. And some people use it with poetry and some people use it with, you know, you can use it with photographs, you can use it with cartoons is a really important skill. So if it's something that interests you, uh, vtshome.org is the place to get more information. And I especially love it because of that requirement to make evidence-based claims, which is obviously a common core. What do you see that makes you say that? You know, you don't, you get everyone, you don't, you get to have, uh, you get to make evidence-based claims. You don't just get to spout off opinions. You have to be able to back up your claims with evidence. Does anyone else out there have a particularly useful close reading tool that they uh, like? that they want to share? Everyone's mic is off but mine. Um, I'll share the link no. in, in, a, in a second too, but the, um, the Teaching with Primary Sources uh, program at the Library of Congress has some really great, um, and it's very parallel or very similar to what um, the visual thinking strategies are, but it's just another source with some nice packages of primary um, documents and images that that you can use with students to really get their juices flowing around interesting events and, you know, just those images, too. Yeah. All right. Um, Christine. And, yes, I was just going to add that often um, for close reading techniques, I like to have students as they're reading through an article, and this is definitely sort of um, needs an article or a, a piece of text but to really have them interact with the text in a way where they do a check mark for um, something that the author is saying that they agree with, put an exclamation point for something that's new or surprising, put a question mark next to something that, that they have a question about or they want more information about. And that's one of the sort of go-to techniques that I use often to have students when they read a text and then reread it with these kind of ways of interacting with the text and it helps them to, to frame discussions around the text with each other and with the teacher. Um, and so that's a, a technique that I use um, quite a bit. So another thing that came out in uh, among the comments, the write your way in 
that happened before the session was organizing ideas and citation was a skill that they wanted their students to take away. And I just thought, man, National History Day is a model that really is pretty phenomenal for this. And again, um, I'd be real interested in seeing in the chat if anyone has looked at National History Day about or thought about doing this with their kids. What it is, is it's a nationally recognized history education program and it's contest based, uh, but you don't have to participate in the contests in order to use the curriculum. Every year there's a theme. This year's theme is taking a stand in history, uh, and students get to choose any topic to research independently on that team. But as a teacher, you can limit that. So if you're doing Montana history, you can say you have to choose a Montana history topic to research on that theme. Um, and you have to get information. And the nice thing about a theme is it requires a more complicated thesis than this is what happened, because you have to tie what your, uh, your topic to a theme. So you, get a, you, you learn that. Um, not just the research skills, but the writing skills, and it requires annotated bibliographies. It requires that you use primary and secondary sources, and the contest model allows you to present your evidence, your project in several ways, from an exhibit to a performance. But as a teacher, if what you really want them to do is write a paper, then you can require them to write a paper, and that's one of the, you know, so you as a teacher get to limit it to make sure it's meeting your class needs, but there's freedom for the students to choose a topic that is actually interesting to them, uh, which engages them. And if you do get involved in a contest, then there's some motivation to, to do a good job creating the annotated bibliography and do the citations correctly. I know when my daughter participated, uh, she hated doing that citations and bibliography and she only did it because she wanted to win the contest so but it is still a valuable skill um not so not necessarily you know knowing the right formula and that of course i'm going to speak as the, the the teacher librarian in the group but it's that you know giving giving credit to the intellectual property of others or to understand in a very real way that information comes from somewhere and we it need is. to we need to acknowledge that but I, I think it's it I think what gets really exciting is when you do that annotation that a student has to you know if you set up criteria for that uh, that the annotation needs to give some context um, it needs to uh, include some information about why you chose a particular source um, and I think that's as valuable in in some ways kind of like uh, what I was saying about paraphrasing in the chat too you know those are in immensely critical skills for being able to analyze and evaluate information in in very powerful ways and all of that takes practice absolutely and I did not in any way mean to suggest that it was not valuable I'm just saying that she was refusing to learn it <laughs> until she wanted to win the contest so she, yeah. she walked away with something really important by any um, means necessary right <laughs> exactly so another skill that people talked about wanting their students to walk away with was being able to evaluate primary and secondary sources. There's a ton of graphic organizers to help you do this. I think Kole mentioned the Library of Congress has one, National Archives has one, TPS uh, Barat has one. And again, Polly and Tammy, if you have favorites, I'd love to hear about it. I'm going to share one of my new favorites, um, which is the History Project Six C's, and the Six C's are content, citation, context, connections, communications, and conclusions. So it looks like this, more or less. Um, it has better boxes than this, so this is. It didn't translate into PowerPoint super well, but I like it because it's uh, you know you, you're required to pull out the main idea. You're asking author, creator, and who created it, which also leads you to why, you know, why they created it. It's important to know who created things, not just to give credit, but to understand their point of view and their perspective. And I think we were talking a little bit about that in the Google Doc. And unlike a lot of the other primary source tools, it's trying to move beyond the document itself to the, to the context. And I think that's a super uh, significant thing that a lot of the other primary source tools tend to stay just simply within 
the, the document. Uh, but this one, you know, uh, moves beyond that. I also really uh, have an, another great model, I think, is this um, Stanford History Education Group. I think it was Tammy It was like, what's Shag in the document? And I was like, it's not a groupie. This is my favorite. And they really, this is their model, is sourcing, you know, asking who wrote this, why was it written, when was it written, um, you know, what was the author's perspective, how reliable is it, also looking at that context, how might the circumstances in which the document was created affect its content, corroborating, what did the other documents say, do they agree, why or why not, what are other possible things I could look at, which ones are most reliable, and then doing that kind of close reading. And these are real world skills, I think, that we need to teach our students. I think we were talking a little bit in the chat about, uh, or in the Write Your Way In, about how important it was to teach students to do research and to figure out what kind of information is reliable. And uh, Sheg talks about this as the habits of historical thinking, that, you know, you always have to ask um, who wrote this, when was it written, and for what purpose, you know. And um, then you can move on to these questions about reliability and the like. I just also, along those same lines, um, found uh, something that really takes those two models and has um, put it in this really groovy little, uh, it's a plastic, and in the middle is clear plastic, so you can see it uh, has the question, the sourcing questions on the left, who created it, who's the intended audience, and then the close, the contextualizing and close reading questions on the right, and then the document, this is a clear frame, the document goes in the middle, um, so I just put a document in there, and you can write on them with dry erase markers, so you can circle things and just underline them in arrow, and kind of work with this document on the, this uh, transparency. So here's an example of how you might do that, and then it just erases. I don't know, teachers, do you, I think this seemed like a ridiculously useful tool. Oh, good. Tammy says that's often awesome. I'm assuming she's talking about these <laughs> this SDAC things. Are you, Tammy? Yeah, that's really that is really cool. I love that. I thought it was maybe yeah. So anyway, you can order them. And we can, Kole, can we put this into the link? Uh, SocialStudiesCentral.com. My products. Um, and I think, like I said, they're they're about thirty eight dollars, forty dollars for a classroom set, and. I'm pretty, and I just got mine, I didn't get a whole classroom set, I just got a sample, it just arrived on last Monday, and I was um, excited to start playing with them. It's just deceptively simple, and, and I think that's, you know, one of the strengths or one of the things that we sometimes forget is that it doesn't have to be ritzy and glitzy and, and have, you know, a battery and a cord and all of that. It's just, mm -hmm. um, I think it would be cool to have to have that, especially if you had a light box um, or and maybe that's not even necessary to have it. Yeah, it. you know, I guess you could do it on a, if you had you to project, but if you have a classroom set, everyone gets their own, you know? Yeah. And I just love the way, you know, who created it? And they just circled at the bottom and put an arrow there, you know? <laughs> When do you think it was created? Late 1800s, and why? You know, convenience people to move west. So you can just kind of point to things, and you know, what are the influences? You know, they're kind of pointing around to stuff, and um, yeah, and yeah. you can. Jen and Polly, Polly Ashton, and I teach four space. How can we use this with our students? They have a K five version of this also. So this is a six twelve version, but they have a they have another version that's K five. So I think it would be um, the this, the questions. It's basically the same thing, only the language is a little bit simpler. Yeah. So a really think, really fun. I think this is really great. I love the interactiveness of it. You know, just in the fact that students then can have the that interactive back and forth, like actually circle here where you know where you think you know what where that evidence is in this picture, or or circle the text or underline and. Um, I just think anytime we get that interaction going on, that's where um, students can really start to draw those connections to the evidence and start to, to learn the language to talk about how their evidence supports whatever it is they're claiming or understanding or contextualizing about that piece. So I think I think this is really great. Kole, yeah. we need to find a, a way we can use these. <laughs> oh, absolutely. 
Um, and I, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, one of the big skills besides sourcing, besides asking who created it, when, and for what purpose, like every single document, every single article, everything, I hope you are having your kids ask those questions, um, is the idea that I need evidence to back up my claims, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Tom Rust, who's a professor at um, MSU Billings, used to say, you know, opinions are like noses, everyone has one, and they <laughs> smell, <laughs> you know. Oh, I love it. So, so you know, I, you know I, and I would tell students, I don't care about your opinion, I care about, you know, your evidence-based <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, what is, you know, and then those are two different things, and those are absolutely ELA skills, Tammy, yeah, as she mentioned. So, for sure, there's a lot of overlap, I think. Um, it's one of the reasons why some people got really stressed out about Common Core, that they, they put history under ELA, and it actually didn't bother me that much, because I think the skills are very connected. Um, Without yeah. a doubt, without a doubt, when we're talking yeah. about information skills analysis, it's we're all speaking the same language, perhaps with a little bit different vocabulary sometimes. But the heart of it is that these are essential skills that, that students need to have across the board. Yeah, and Tammy just asked a really good question. How do we teach our students to be savvy internet researchers? And um, again, I went to this great presentation by Sam Weinberg, who, who's the one who founded the Stanford History Education Group, who talked about that a lot. Um, and again, looking at a website and said, who created this? For what purpose? <laughs> when was it created? Um, and anymore, you know, we used to tell kids, oh, don't you, you know, if it's .com, it's not. Um, reliable, but if it's .org, it is, but that's absolutely untrue now, mm -hmm. you know, so they really need to be way more sophisticated um, and I, in, I, in terms of thinking about authorship and purpose. And I think I, I think the way that we teach our students to be savvy internet researchers are is is to help them practice with analysis, whether it's online, um, whether it's a primary source, whatever it is. But I think there's also a responsibility to take the time to model for students what it is to be a savvy, ethical, um, you know, and efficient internet researcher. Um, I think like anything, we can't just assume or, you know, put out rules, you know, always do this or always don't do this. Um, kids, we actually have to help them um, engage and and to practice those skills too. So it's hard to maybe think about sometimes putting a pause on other parts of curriculum that we uh, feel like we need to cover. Um, we do that sometimes at the expense of developing the underlying skills that are going to serve students better in getting that content um, later on. So I really highly recommend being very intentional about teaching these skills um, and that it begins in preschool and kindergarten, that we begin um, at the early stages in, in um, you know, in the developmentally appropriate way, um, giving students the opportunity to practice and to become really proficient so that when we unleash them into the wild, wild world of the internet or other places, um, once they, they leave us, um, then they're really prepared. I, and I just want to add to um, that I think it's important just because, you know, we're teaching them to question authorship, you know, and the purpose of things are created. And just because everything has a perspective and a purpose for being created does not mean that there's not truth out there. I think that's something that sometimes kids fall into, this idea, well, it's just all um, perspective. And it absolutely, perspective absolutely impacts, um, you know, what is written, but that doesn't mean that there is not also something that's, that is true. Um, and we might not be able to find it, especially historically, you know, we might have to, you know, it's hard to, to get at it, but we definitely want to approach it. And be um, persistent, be, to, to yeah. use that perseverance and persistence, which and you know, we talk a lot about in mathematics as mathematical practice, but the same applies here. We need to persist. And, and it's, it's really about corroboration, too, you know, and so mm -hmm. looking at things from multiple different angles to try to kind of, it's a calculus, you know, get as close to truth as possible when we're talking about history. I love it. So, so. Martha, we're at 4.32 p.m. So All right. 
I, if, without any other questions at the moment, I would like to um, have us move forward. All right, because it's time to go. It is. So um, I'm uh, just going to uh, say that I'm happy to stay on and visit with people uh, afterwards if you want to keep talking or you still have questions, but to be respectful of the 4 to 4.30, we can um, say we hope uh, you'll uh, go to the Write Your Way Out to earn renewal units for this um, class, but also just because it's useful to process information that way. Absolutely. And we, and we hope that we will see you, um, oh, here we go. This is how you get there. You have to go to, go ahead, Cole, you can do this. Oh, part. sure. Yeah, just briefly, if you haven't already signed up on the Teacher Learning Hub, you can go to the address that's on the screen there, sign up for a quick free account, and enroll in the course. Um, it is called um, the Teaching Montana History Online PLC. And I think we can go to the next slide. And once you get enrolled in that course, you'll see for October um, a Write Your Way Out. It's a discussion forum. And um, there are a number of people, about 10, who have completed September. So we look forward to your responses. Martha is wonderful about replying and reviewing your information. So this is the prompt for Write Your Way Out for October. And you can always contact me away from the class, and we hope to see you um, next month for reading strategies, because I know that um, working with Montana Stories of the Land textbook has been a challenge for some people, so we're going to talk about reading strategies. And uh, end of show, I think. That is fantastic. <laughs>